Good morning, church family. Once again, I'd like to welcome you to Heartland Christian Church's service this morning. As you are watching this service at home this morning, uh, there will be people sitting in the church house um, as you're watching this, watching us record next week's service. And uh, if you're not confused or as already as to how that works, then watch the video that uh, me and Dad have put together. You will be seeing that, or should have seen that already, um, and explaining how all this is going to be working as far as uh, allowing our congregation to come back into the church while we're doing these uh, services. So please uh, watch that, and uh, you will see how how all this is working. And we just ask that if you do choose to come to the church service next week, um, or whenever you do choose to come, you do follow the guidelines that we have set out. And uh, we just uh, pray that it all continues to work and uh, it continues to work well. As we uh, start our service this morning, would you please pray with me? Almighty Father, we thank you so much for this time we had to come and sing praises to you this morning. And Father, we just, uh, again, we thank you for this ability that we have to still come and gather together for worship. And Father, we know that even though we are bringing our congregation back, it's still not church as it is. And uh, Father, I just continue to pray that our uh, congregation continues to flourish uh, from the ministry here that we have at Heartland Christian Church. Father, I pray, I pray a special blessing upon this service, and I pray that it will be a blessing and uplifting unto you. Of all these things, I ask and pray in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join us as we start out with our first song this morning, Joy Unspeakable.
wish my son to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand up for you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. beautiful song that talks about the beautiful ancient words that we find in the book of life and um, we just uh, sing this with us as we uh, end our song service this morning ancient words
Father, we thank you for your son Jesus, and we thank you for those ancient words that we find in your word, Father. We thank you and pray that they do indeed change us and turn our lives around towards your son Jesus, Father. We Again, we thank you for that. We thank you for your, your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the sacrifice that your son Jesus made. And it's in all these things I ask and pray in your son's name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you once again. And uh, as Kevin was sharing with you very soon, uh, we'll all be back together, at least the majority of us. And, uh, you know, your safety is uh, our utmost concern. So we just hope and pray that you'll pray about it and some use some good common sense. And uh, we hope to be able to see you here for the service. Uh, once again, uh, the song selection uh, just really touched my heart this week. And there's one song in particular, uh, Ancient Words. Uh, I know they're one of my favorites, uh, one of my, the favorites of my wife's and also Greg. Uh, it's a favorite of many people. And that song, Ancient Words, that we sang about this morning, Paul talks about the characteristics, some of the characteristics of those ancient words in 2 Timothy 3.16. This, this is not part of the message, but I, I want to tell, kind of include this. But this is what he, what he says about those ancient words. Those ancient words are God-breathed, and that's so very, very important. Greg and I, no minister, no writer put these together other than what God directed them through the Holy Spirit to put together. They are ancient word. But he says these ancient words are God-breathed, and they're used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. But they are also used to comfort, to console, to encourage, and strengthen in times of trouble. So I pray that what you receive from Greg and I, I pray that what you receive from our praise team each and every week serves that purpose to encourage, to comfort you, to, to instill within your life's hope to get you through a new week, because I know that's the prayer of each and every one of us. The ancient words I want to take a look at this morning, if you have your Bibles, come from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. The message I've entitled this morning, The God of All Comfort. The God of All Comfort. And if you want to go ahead and turn there or, or use your phones, whatever you want to use, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 here in just a moment. There are two age-old questions that have been asked of God down through the centuries and continue to be asked of God today. And I'm sure as I make mention of these questions in just a moment, you probably would have find yourself somewhere in life asking these very same two questions, and these are those questions. God, why do bad things happen to good or godly people? God, why do you allow the pain and suffering in the lives of many to exist? And I think we've asked those questions a number of times ourselves to God. And I love the response that a minister by the name of Thomas Crabtree uh, writes concerning this. This is what he says. He says, while, there, while these are intriguing questions, we will never be able to answer them adequately. By the same token, countless numbers of people down through the ages have also experienced the comfort of God, and we cannot adequately explain that either, but we can experience it, and we've all experienced that and continue to experience it. If God is going to be blamed for the allowance of pain and suffering, should he not be thanked or even praised for the comfort that we receive in his blessings? And we would all say amen to that. We would all say amen to that. But in our text this morning, Paul shares with us the reality of life. But he doesn't stop there. He talks about the ministry of comfort that God provides. So I want to take a look at these first five verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 through 5. If you'd like to follow along as I read. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all the saints throughout Achaia. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows." 
You may have heard me say this before, and in my heart of hearts, I truly, truly believe this. I truly believe that this word comfort that we find mentioned 45 times, 47 times in the Bible is a word that God never intended to be in man's vocabulary. Because in order to receive comfort, one has to be in some sort of discomfort, some sort of pain, some sort of of anguish, some sort of turmoil that person is going through. But I truly believe in my heart that God never intended for that to take place. And we see that from the very beginning. In Genesis there, we see that God put Adam and Eve in a, in, a, in a beautiful world, in a beautiful garden, free of pain, void of sorrow and troubles and struggles. He did not create man to sorrow. He did not create man to sorrow. I mean, we knew how and where all that came about. The sinfulness of mankind brought the world that we now live in that presents the world that now exists. And for that purpose, and for that purpose alone, God comforts. The the necessity of comfort and compassion has now come into play because of man's sinfulness and the fall of man. It's it's kind of ironic. I've often wondered, maybe you have too, how long Adam and Eve enjoyed the comfort and compassion, the, the fellowship of God that they experienced before Eve was led astray, and Adam was led astray by the great deceiver, the serpent in the garden. What they were deceived by, that that beautiful-looking apple, it was good. Everything that God created was good. It was just off limits. It was just off limits. But there again goes the direction of man, the desire to have what we can't have, the desire to have what is off limits, led them and led to the fall and now what we experience. So the necessity of comfort and compassion has now come into play. Notice, if you will, once again, verses 3 and 4, because what I want to mention first is what God allows, what you and I have a tendency to struggle with, what God allows. But look at verse 3 and 4 once again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our Troubles. All of our troubles. What God allows, He allows troubles. If you can show me, I wish that you would show me, but yet I have, I've never yet to find where the Bible ever one time promises you and I a trouble-free life. Never one time have I ever found that those who belong to the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, are exempt from the difficulties of life. Now, there have been some ministers down through the years and through the ages that you and I have heard that claim that it's there, but it isn't. How many times have we heard a minister say, if you just had enough faith, if you just had enough faith, your finances wouldn't be in a situation. If you just had enough faith, your your health would not be failing. If you just had enough faith, and it's like, um, excuse me, have you ever read your Bible? Look at the followers of Jesus Christ and all the things that they went through. Some of the most faithful in the world, past and present, continue to struggle. That is our lot in life. The Bible reminds us that the rain falls on the just and the unjust, but we have the comforter in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't promise such foolishness. In fact, it realistically predicts that tomorrow we will have trouble. For instance, in in Matthew 6, 34, Jesus reminds us in, in my phrase, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough troubles of its own. And amen to that. Why would you want to borrow the troubles of tomorrow when we're dealing with what we're dealing with, our own? And I've shared this with you in John 16, 33. Jesus himself said, In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. What about James? In James chapter 1, verse 2, this is what he says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Notice something here. James does not not say if you face trials of many kinds, but when you face trials of many kinds. One of life's realities While God never promised us a trouble-free life, secondly, I want us to notice what he does promise, comfort. You know, just just to allow that word comfort to roll off the tongue is, is so soothing. And actually, that's part of the definition of comfort, to soothe in times of grief or fear. One that provides or brings an ease or a relief. 
You know, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I had a tendency to really bring a wrong definition of the word comfort and what it means and, and how God can exactly comfort us. And, and if you'll allow me, I rarely do I do this, but I want to share uh, in my NIV Bible the, what the commentary author has to say uh, about this. So listen to this for a moment, and maybe it'll bring a new perspective on this word comfort. This is what he writes. Many times, uh, see, many think that when God comforts us, our troubles should go away. But if that were always so, people would turn to God only out of a desire to be relieved of pain and not out of love for Him. We must understand that being comforted can also mean receiving strength, encouragement, and hope to deal with all of our troubles. The more we suffer, the more comfort God gives us. And he goes on to say, if you are feeling overwhelmed, allow God to comfort you. Remember that every trial you endure will help you comfort other people who are suffering similar troubles. You ever thought about that before? You know, we do get that confused. Lord, I need your comfort. I need to be set free of this when he might be doing a whole different thing in in our lives by allowing us to endure it and making us stronger in in our faith. In Isaiah 66, verse 13, the author writes, As a mother comforts her child, God comforts his children. And I was looking up some other passages that I hope and pray would bring a comfort to you, and I ran across Psalm 34, 15. The author writes, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and he, his ears are attentive to their cry. And I got to thinking about that in light of a mother's love. And isn't it interesting? And some of the ladies who are here can probably attest to this, can, uh, can verify this. It doesn't matter how many children they have, individually, distinctively, they know each child's cry. They know each child's cry. But think about this in perspective with God. He hears and is attentive to our cry. Each and every one of us, when we are going through a a difficult situation, He hears us individually. He knows us, He loves us, and He knows what we need, and He comforts us. You know, I don't know about you, but I know there have been times when I've gone through trials and difficulties. I've tried to do it on my own. Maybe you have too. And, and, and how foolish that is for a child of God, one who belongs to Him, where faithfulness and trust is so important to our Heavenly Father and in our relationship with Him. For instance, Jesus trusted God when He was dying on the cross. And in Luke 23, 46, He spoke these words, Father, into Your hands I commit my spirit. He gave His life, He gave His situation over to the Father, to the Father's will, to the Father's care. And the Lord, the Heavenly Father, watched over him and brought Jesus through that terrible ordeal. And he promises to do the same. Bring that comfort in that situation for you and I as well. The Lord knows what we're going through. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16. And notice what the author writes here. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There's a saying, and we've probably all heard this saying before, no one understands our situation like one who has been there. No one understands our situation any better unlike one who has been there. Jesus has been there. Whatever we go through, whatever we endure in life, whatever kind of pain, whatever kind of sorrow, whatever kind of loss, He has been there, and He has experienced that. What about Psalm 46, 1 through 3? It says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Let me ask you something. Has life ever felt that way? 
where everything was just falling apart, where everything just seemed to be caving in. God is our refuge, even the even in the midst of the greatest turmoils of life. He is there to comfort and to keep us through the storms of life. He promises comfort to each and every one of us. And the last thing I want us to see, coming from verse 3 and 4 as well, what God expects from you and I, His children. He expects that we comfort others with this very same comfort that you and I have received. Let's take a look at that once again, if you would, please. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles. Notice the purpose. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. You know, I read that and and I got thinking about that. God does not comfort us to make us comfortable. He comforts us to become comforters of other people as well. There is an old hymn, and, and you know, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I really miss a lot of the old hymns that we don't sing anymore because many of those old hymns have a powerful message. And you may remember this old hymn entitled, Make Me a Blessing. But there's a couple of verses I want to share with you in light of our call to be comforters of others. Verse 1 and verse 3. Verse 1 says, Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Verse 3 says, Give as t'was given to you in your need, love as a master loved you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed, unto your mission be true. Make me a blessing, out of my life may Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray, make me a blessing to someone today. I don't know about you, but I would think that would be a most appropriate prayer to pray each and every day. Lord, how can I be a blessing to someone else today? What God expects from us, the comfort and concern for other people as well. As I said, God does not comfort us to make us comfortable, but to make us comforters. C.S. Lewis said, What is good in any painful experience is for the sufferer his submission to the will of God. And for the spectators with compassion aroused and the acts of mercy to which it leads. I love that. We have a call upon our lives. You know, God is depending upon you and I to fulfill his will. And we need to be that bridge over troubled water so that God's blessings and God's kindness and God's care can come into the lives of those who need it. You know, preparing this message, just thinking about all that's going on in the world, naturally this virus that's been going on forever, and and the ways that people have been dealing with that, the loss of loved ones, loss of jobs, uh, businesses. But but not only that, the the race riots that are taking place and and the hatred that seems uh, to be there from the very highest to the very lowest, and even in our own congregation, the the loved ones who have passed away, those who are dealing with, with cancers, that are terminal, and on and on, on and on we can go. If ever there was a need for comfort in our day and age, it's now. It is now. And God comforts us so that we can be comforting others as well. I have a question. What makes someone a good comforter to those who are in need? Now, if you're watching, you can't see, but I'm going to ask those who are here a question, and I want them to raise their hands. And if you're at home and you want to raise your hand, even though I can't see it, that's fine. But I want to ask you something. Are there well-meaning people in your life, even Christian brothers and sisters, that you love and they love you, but are there people that you wouldn't want comforting you in anything? <laughs> Yes, I don't, you can't see this uh, at, at all at home, but a whole lot of hands went up. There's people I love dearly, but there's some people, stay away. <laughs> They're not very comforting whatsoever, and a lot of times they make you feel worse, you see. So there are, you know, anyway, so I ran across an article I found interesting, and it was written by Bob Russell several years ago, and it's entitled, The Best Comforters. 
So he, he uh, mentioned some qualities of those who are truly wonderful comforters, and this is the, these are the qualities. The first one he says is a gift of mercy. Everyone is commanded to sing, though only a few have outstanding God-given musical abilities. In the same way, everyone is to be merciful, but God specifically equipped some people to show mercy. They instinctively know how to empathize with others. They can weep with those who weep. They can express emotion easily, and they know just what to say or not to say. They are a wonderful help to those who suffer. And maybe you have somebody like that in your life. A second quality that Bob mentions, an outgoing relationship. When we hurt, we usually receive the most comfort from those who know us the best and love us the most. So a lot of times that would uh, entail our family or our closest friends and hopefully a lot of our church family as well. A third quality, experience, and I mentioned this a moment ago. No one understands like someone who has been there. But he goes on to write, although no two situations are exactly alike, those who have experienced discomfort can identify with the pain and the sorrows that others experience. And how true that is. A fourth quality of a good comforter, a proven faith, and that is important as well. Only when we ourselves have been comforted by God and sustained by our faith in Christ are we qualified to encourage others to remain faithful. Would we fit that category? Would we make good comforters to those who are in need? I hope and pray, I hope and pray that we would. We are to comfort as we have been comforted. God comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And I want to ask you a question this morning in closing. Do you need the comfort that only God can provide? Do you need the comfort that He can provide to bring a peace and a stability, a hope and assurance in your life? If you need that, then just like Jesus, the example of Jesus, commit your life, your situation to Him, to the Father's care. Place it in the Father's hand, and He will bring you through. In Nahum chapter 1-7, I mentioned this a moment ago, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. So there's yet another question. As you find yourself in the situation you find yourself in, are you putting your trust in the one who loves you, in the one who promised to care for you, the God of compassion, the God of all comfort? He wants to be that God for your life. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Now, I pray if, for those who are out there this morning who may be listening, who are going through a difficult time, and right now we know that that's many, that these ancient words may have brought a source of comfort to those who are listening, watching, or hearing. Father, that they might be encouraged by your words, not my words, but by your words, as they continue their journey each and every day. Father, as Greg comes forward shortly to lead us in a time of communion, we are reminded even further of your love for us and the compassion that was bestowed upon us in our time of need. Since the beginning, the onset of the fall of man, we've needed that comfort, we've needed that compassion, that forgiveness. And we know the Old Testament, what it couldn't accomplish in, in the Old Covenant, the New Covenant brings new hope through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we remember those things as we meet around this table. Father, you indeed are the God of all comfort. And I pray this, dear Heavenly Father, once again, for those who are going through a difficult time, I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, and as you can tell, Kevin and I dressed in sync today, almost perfectly, except mine's bigger than his. It is sure good to be here, and as we do get ready to open the church house and um, 
try to restore some worship. What a great thought that Kevin brought to us about God never intended for us to suffer. And as we share in our communion thoughts today, I want to look back at just one particular verse and then share a little bit out of Revelation. God had never intended a single human to suffer eternity away from Him. He is the God of all mercies. First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians, as Kevin read, verse 3, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the Father of forgiveness, and the Father of hope. After the fall of man, after sin entered the world, God had to get away from the world he sends His Son through His people. He raised up a people, and those people's only purpose was to get the Messiah in the world. And once Jesus got here, He brought that new covenant, that covenant of mercy and of hope and of relief from what was coming because of sin in the world. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the serpent. You remember the snake, the deceiver, the great liar. He grabbed hold of the serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until... The thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Verse 7, And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, future tense, and will come out to deceive the nations in the four corners of, and gather in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war, and the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. They came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, which we know as Jerusalem. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, whose presence is an earth, the, whose presence the earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were opened, and another book which was open, the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in this book and the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. The death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. They were judged, every one according to their deeds. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Verse 8 of chapter 21. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the immoral persons, the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone which is his second death. Jesus came and he brought to us the great gospel, the news of life. He lived here three years. He gave himself a perfect lamb, if you will, for us black sheep. And he asked us to come around this table this table of remembrance, this table of forgiveness, this table of covenant to remember our Savior and to remember the God of mercies who brings us life and saves us from this day that's coming. It is coming. And as we take a few minutes this particular day and we partake of the fruit of the vine and the bread as Jesus says, represents His blood and His body. I hope we are comforted. We should be. And we should be so humbled and so thankful 
that our God loves us enough that He has no desire for anyone to end up in that lake of fire. And He tells us that in His great Word. So as we commune together, let's thank God for His mercy. Father, as we come, we thank You for the great gift of life not of this life on this earth, but the life to come, true life with You. And for all those who find their name in the book of life, it is truly joy unspeakable. To us who are so undeserving, but yet Your mercy falls upon those who fall on their knees before You. We thank You for these great words. I thank You for Kevin's great words. God never intended us to be miserable, ever. And He still doesn't. Help us be ready when Jesus comes. It's in His name we pray. Amen.